Hey, Ron. Yeah? Why didn't you say it the first time I said a a Ron? Because it's pronounced Aaron. You done messed up, a Ron! Good morning, everybody. We are live. Happy Christmas Eve. I uh, wanted to get in a little live stream here to talk about uh, fraudster, con man, Scientologist, future inmate of some federal penitentiary, or however you say that word, penitentiary, <laughs> penitentiary. Um, Grant Cardone um, has lost a recent decision uh, regarding the class action lawsuit against him and Cardone Capital. Um, wanted to... Just briefly cover that. I won't read this entire brief. And also, I am not an expert in securities law or any law for that matter. I am not a lawyer and I am not giving legal advice. Uh, if any of my viewers are uh, an expert in securities law and would like to um, come on um, and do some videos, live videos with me reviewing some of the uh, issues in this case, that would be fantastic. Uh, let me bring up this thing. So basically, there was a class action lawsuit brought against Grant Cardone. And that lawsuit had been dismissed by a federal district court in California, kind of on a, a bit of a technicality that um, that based on the complaint, Grant Cardone was technically not a seller of securities. And the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit has uh, reviewed this and reversed the decision and the lawsuit will stand. Uh, so let's take a look at this. United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, Luis Pino on behalf of himself and all others sim uh, similarly situated, versus Cardone Capital LLC, Grant Cardone, Cardone Equity Fund 5, Cardone Equity Fund 6. All right, so let's see. I've got the actual thing on a different page here. Okay. Bear with me here, folks. All right, I'm not going to attempt to read this whole thing, but I have already read it through so that I have a general idea of which parts of this thing are going to be helpful. So let's give this a shot. Oh, boy. My mouse is giving me trouble. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Come on now. The panel affirmed in part and reversed in part the district court's dismissal pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12B6 of Luis Pino's suit against Grant Cardone, Cardone Capital LLC, Cardone Equity Fund 5 LLC, and Cardone Equity Fund 6, alleging violations of the Securities Act based on material misstatements or omissions in certain real estate investment offering materials uh pino yeah so uh just you know i'm not this isn't a video where i just read an entire brief i'm going to give some commentary so you know uh grant cardone is uh, he says he's in real estate he's not he's really in finance <laughs> and yes there's overlap between these two industries but i don't consider that grant cardone is in real estate he's in finance he raises a bunch of money from unaccredited investors on social media uh, and, and basically has everyone else, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't manage the properties. He's basically a middleman. He takes money, he buys properties, he hires people to, to manage the properties. He takes a massive cut of the profits and his investors, I, I believe, um, depending on which type of investor you are, you're either, you're either getting a maximum of a 4% annual return or a 6% annual return. In, in any case, why anybody would give their money to Grant Cardone, uh, is beyond me, but you know, he prides himself on raising his money through Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And um, yeah, there's a reason why Grant Cardone is the only one who really does that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Pino brought claims under Section 12A2 of the Securities Act against all defendants and a claim pursuant to Section 15 of the Securities Act against Cardone and Cardone Capital. At issue was whether Cardone and Cardone Capital count as persons who offer or sell securities under Section 12A based on their social media communication to prospective investors. The district court concluded that Cardone and Cardone Capital did not qualify as statutory sellers, and that is why the district court um, dismissed the lawsuit, um, essentially on that basis. All right. Oh, good. We can see the whole thing here. Good. 
The panel concluded that Section 12 contains no requirement that a, solicita that a solicitation be directed to or targeted to a particular plaintiff and accordingly held that a person can solicit a purchase within the meaning of the Securities Act by promoting the sale of a security in mass communication because the first amended complaint sufficiently alleges that Cardone and Cardone Capital were engaged in solicitation of investments in funds five and six, the district court erred in dismissing Pino's claim against Cardone and Cardone Capital under Section 12A2 and also erred in dismissing his Section 15 claim for lack of a primary violation of the Securities Act. In a separate memorandum disposition, the panel concluded that some of the defendants challenged statements are actionable under the Securities Act. OK, now uh, this the title of this thing uh, in the very beginning and at the very end says that it was affirmed in part and reversed in part. And I have struggled to find the part of this document that says which part was affirmed. Um, I did only read it through once, but uh, it's one of the reasons I wanted to put this document here. If I can figure out how to link to this document in the description down below, then I will. I would love feedback from other viewers going through this thing, letting me know uh, maybe anything I've misunderstood, anything I'm getting wrong, uh, anything I seem to have uh, not totally grasped the significance of. Uh, let's take a look at a bit more of this. Opinion. All right. Plaintiff Luis Pino filed suit against Grant Cardone, Cardone Capital LLC, Cardone Equity Fund 5, Cardone Equity Fund 6, alleging violations of the Securities Act based on material misstatements or omissions in certain real estate investment offering materials. Specifically, Pino brought claims under Section 12A2 of the Securities Act against all defendants. This is not the same thing I just read, right? I'm pretty sure it's not. Pino appeals arguing, OK, I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. The district court dismissed all claims under federal rule of civil procedure 12B6. Pino appeals, arguing that the district court erred in holding that Cardone and Cardone Capital LLC are not sellers. In this opinion, we hold that Pino plausibly stated a claim that Cardone and Cardone Capital qualify as statutory sellers under the Securities Act. In a separate memorandum disposition filed concurrently with this opinion, we conclude that some of the defendants challenged statements are actionable under this act. We therefore affirm in part and reverse in part the district court's dismissal of Pino's claims. Okay, background. All right, so this is going to give us a little bit more of, of the background for those who are interested. I'm trying to figure out how to get this all on screen. Cardone founded Cardone Capital in 2017 and its CEO and is its CEO and sole manager. Cardone Capital is a real estate property management company that invests in property by pooling money from many other investors. Cardone Capital manages Cardone Equity Fund 5 and 6, which invest in real estate assets throughout the U.S. Funds 5 and 6 are categorized as emerging growth companies, um, uh, a law that reduces reporting and accounting requirements for emerging companies, and that enables the sale of securities using crowdfunding techniques. Our, da, 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 investments in funds five and six were subject to regulation A, which exempts offerings from registration with the SEC, but are subject to certain requirements, including submission to the SEC of an offering statement, disclosing information about the proposed offering on form 1A, which is subject to qualification by the SEC before the offering can proceed. Reg A provides that the SEC does not pass upon the merits of or give its approval to any securities offered or the terms of the offering, nor does it pass upon the accuracy or completeness of any offering circular or other solicitation materials. Fund 5 began receiving subscriptions on December 12, 2018 and raised $50 million as of September 20, 2019. The First Amendment complaint alleges that when Fund 5 closed, hold on, I got to get my, there we go. That when Fund 5 closed, Cardone posted on the Cardone Capital Instagram account that Fund 5 is the first Reg A of its kind to raise $50 million in crowdfunding using social media. And that by accessing social media, I am offering investment opportunities to the everyday investor like you. Uh, a plus, oh, I'm sorry, this is the largest, oh, this is a quote now, I guess. All right, come on now. Come on now. 
this is the largest da, 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 of this quality using social media. Oh, this is like a quote from the promotional materials. By using no middleman and going directly to the public, using social media, we reduce our costs. This ensures more of your money goes directly to the assets, resulting in lower uh, promotional costs. More importantly, investors gain access to real estate that has never been available before. Uh, Fund 6 began receiving subscriptions on October 2019 and raised $50 million as of June 25, 2020. This is something that Cardone says in his promotions that really belies the fraudulent nature of his pitch to investors. He goes, uh, never before has the, the common man been able to uh, invest in these, in these uh, multi-hundred million dollar properties. And, and here's the thing. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Buying one, buying into like one one thousandth of a hundred million dollar property is not any better than buying into ten percent of a hundred thousand dollar property. I mean, I'm, I'm, the math was not intended to be totally correct there. My point is, if you're investing in an asset and you're promised a four percent return. It does not matter if that asset is worth a dollar or a billion dollars. All you're getting is a 4% return. Grant Cardone, when he, do, he does these, these used cars, uh, these used, uh, you know, a used car salesman like pitch tactics where he's pitching features, um, he's pitching benefits that aren't benefits. That's how you know you're talking to a con man. If they're, if they're pitching you benefits that aren't really benefits, but they're designed to sound like they are. Yeah. No one's ever been able to buy into a $300 million property before, unless they had a, you know, $30 million to put down. And you're like, who gives a damn how much the property is worth? If you're invest, if all you're investing is $10,000 and all you're getting is 4% on your money. Do you see what I mean? I I could go on and on and on, but, um, and by the way, a lot of times people ask me, what's your beef with Grant Cardone? My beef with Grant Cardone is that he's one of the primary funders of a human trafficking cult. That's my beef with Grant Cardone. <laughs> I, uh, it's, it's only icing on the cake that I get to expose uh, his fraud and his crimes in the real estate and investment space. So, okay, moving on. Plaintiff Luis Pino alleges that he invested a total of $10,000 in funds five and six. Pino further alleges that he invested in fund five two days after attending a marketing presentation hosted by Cardone in Anaheim, California, titled Breakthrough Wealth Summit. In 2020, uh oh, wait, let me make sure I keep my keep my mouse under control here. In 2020, Pino filed this uh, putative, I think it's put it to putative, putative class action asserting claims under Section 12A2 of the Securities Act against all defendants. Da, 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 da. Pino alleges that in soliciting investments in funds five and six, defendants made untrue statements of material fact, or concealed or failed to disclose material facts in Instagram posts and a YouTube video posted between February 5, 2019 and December 24, 2019. For example, the first, amendment com the first amended complaint describes an April 22, 2019 YouTube video in which Cardone states, it doesn't matter whether the investor is accredited or not accredited, you're going to walk away with a 15% annualized return. If I'm in that deal for 10 years, you're going to earn 150%. You can tell the SEC that's what I said it would be. <laughs> They call me Uncle G. Some people call me Nostradamus because I'm predicting the future, dude. This is what's going to happen. Listen, if you're talking to a guy that's pitching a real estate investment and he calls you dude, just run for the door. Just run for the door. Don't give a guy. <laughs> uh, you know, this is like a, a put on personality that Grant Cardone has adopted. You know that he hasn't always been like this. This is only... <laughs> This is like Grant Cardone is the liver king of real estate investing. <laughs> He's totally full of shit, jacked up on roids, has this fake persona that he puts on because he thinks it appeals to young people who want to be like this, this alpha dog persona that he has adopted. Have you seen videos of Grant Cardone from like 15 years ago. He's a completely different person. Anyway, I think I should, uh, I like that. Grant Cardone is the liver king of real estate. And the liver king was just recently exposed as being a massive fraud, obviously. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. What else do we have here? I totally lost my my place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Annual, they call me Uncle G. Some people call me Nostradamus. And some people call you a dumbass. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, okay. The FAC also quotes several Instagram posts made on both Cardone's personal account. 
and the Cardone Capital account regarding certain internal rates of return, monthly distributions, long-term appreciation. For example, the FAC describes a February 5th, 2019 post in which Cardone asks potential investors on his personal Instagram account, do you want to double your money? Do you want a jet? No, I shouldn't ad lib when I'm reading from a document. Okay. Um, and states that an investor could receive $480,000 in cash flow after investing $1 million, achieve north of 15% returns after fees, uh, and obtain a 118% return amounting to 19.6% per year. Pino alleges that these statements were materially misleading. Yeah, you think so? I mean, everything out of Cardone's mouth is materially misleading. I mean, guys, I just watched this stupid video. Like, YouTube keeps serving me up Cardone content because I've, uh, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of videos on Cardone or whatever. And then looking for, you know, whatever, you know how the Google algorithm works. It's going to serve, it's going to serve you up what it thinks you want to see. And it's Cardone sitting in, uh, in front, you know, uh, with, with a crowd of people and he's doing this little on his little flip paper chart. And he's like, if you have $300 million, don't buy a $300 million property, take that $300 million and buy yourself one point. Two billion dollars worth of property with three hundred million dollars, you can become a billionaire. And I go, does Grant Cardone really think that using three hundred million dollars to take out enough loans to buy one point two billion dollars worth of property makes you a billionaire? No, there's no way he thinks that. But he talks like that to people because he's intentionally pitching his pitch to unaccredited, unsophisticated investors who are just mesmerized with him and his persona and his pitch and this new voice that he talks with that he didn't used to have before. Uh, it's, either, it's either an act or it's just the steroids. And um, anyway, I'm getting off track. So much of what he says is just so obviously bullshit that it's like he's the L. Ron Hubbard of real estate investing. How about that? Well, considering he is a Scientologist, he is liver king and L. Ron Hubbard wrapped up uh, into someone who won't shut the hell up about his private jet <laughs> that he purchased with uh, investor money and that the FBI is going to be very, very interested in. Oh, by the way, I, I don't want to neglect an opportunity to mention the fact that one of the things I have one of the, some of the news I have broken on my channel about Grant Cardone is that the FBI uh, is or was conducting a very thorough investigation into Cardone Capital. I mean, even to the extent where they authorized high level executives at Cardone Capital to wear wires into work and to bring audio and recording devices into work for months on end, co collected Cardone's capital shredding and everything. And, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, the FBI doesn't comment on ongoing investigations. And uh, and unfortunately, I don't think we will ever get official confirmation of the stuff that I've said about this subject unless they decide to move forward, uh, unless um, one of the state attorneys decides to move forward with prosecutions. But if anyone does doubt um, the validity of these things I'm saying about the FBI having uh, authorized surveillance and wiretapping into Cardone Capital. I welcome Grant Cardone to sue me for defamation, and we'll see exactly uh, where those chips fall if he would like to do that. Uh, all right, let's keep going. I lost my place. Now I got to find it again. Okay, let's pick it up here. Pino alleges that these statements were materially misleading. Further, he alleges that none of the communications contained cautionary language, either indicating that the promises were speculative or identifying the risk associated with investing in funds five and that must be a typo six, but instead contain only a generic legend required under SEC rule 255. Defendants moved to dismiss the FAC first amended complaint for failure to claim to failure for failure to state a claim under rule 12b6 the district court granted the motion concluding in part that cardone and cardone capital did not qualify as statutory sellers warranting dismissal of the section 12a2 and section 15 claims against them okay so i think we've ascertained here that the primary mistake by the federal district court was to rule that Grant Cardone technically did not qualify as a seller in this case. It is this particular interpretation of the statutes that the Ninth Circuit has uh, reversed. They said that was wrong. So let me jump forward here. Okay, just a little bit of discussion. I'm guessing I'm not in any particular rush here. So let's just go through some of this. Um, 
I just don't want to make it so boring for everybody. So let me get, let me kind of find, jump to the, uh, jump to the most relevant part that I can here, guys. All right, let's take a look at this. The 11th Circuit recently held that videos posted publicly on YouTube and similar websites can constitute solicitation under Section 12, even if the offerings promoters did not directly target the particular purchasers. Uh, that seems like common sense, so I'm glad the 11th Circuit held that. Uh, <laughs> uh, specifically, the 11th Circuit considered whether a person can solicit a purchase within the meaning of the Securities Act by promoting a security in a mass communication. That's right, because that's what Cardone does. He promotes his securities by means of mass communication and thought that by doing so, he could skirt the legal definition of a seller of a security because he wasn't targeting a specific individual in the process. Guess that didn't work out for you, Cardone. Um, da, da, da. The 11th Circuit concluded that to qualify as solicitation under Section 12, a person must urge or persuade another to buy a particular security, but those efforts... Uh, but those efforts at persuasion need not be personal or individualized. In reaching its holding, the 11th Circuit observed that the Securities Act does not distinguish between individually targeted sales efforts and broadly disseminated pitches, and noted that in early cases applying the Securities Act, quote, people understood solicitation to include communications made through diffuse publicly available means, at the time, newspaper and radio advertisements. Makes perfect sense. The 11th Circuit correctly recognized that nothing in Section 12 expressly requires that solicitation must be direct or personal to a particular purchaser to trigger liability under the statute. Put differently, nothing in the act indicates that mass communications directed to multiple potential purchasers at once fall outside the act's protections. Bingo! On the contrary, the act contains broad language authorizing the purchaser of a security to bring suit against any person who offers or sells a security by means of a prospectus or oral communication that misleads or omits material facts. Well, that describes Grant Cardone to a T. The statute defines offer to sell, offer for sale, and offer as including every attempt to offer, to dispose of, or solicitation of an offer to buy a security or interest in a security for value. Yep. Yep. Makes sense to me. <laughs> um, nor has the Supreme Court imposed a requirement that solicitation under Section 12 requires that a seller actively and directly solicit a plaintiff's investment as defendants contend. Okay, cool. This does go on saying uh, much the same for a little bit. So let me uh, figure out how I can jump ahead here. Okay, I remember, I, I like this part. Creating liability for those who solicit a sale for financial gain, as opposed to limiting the liability to those who simply pass title, is consistent with the Securities Act remedial goal of protecting purchasers from harm caused by promoters' material misstatements and omissions, in part due to the promoters' superior access to information concerning the securities and their valuation. As the court explained, in order to effectuate Congress's intent that Section 121 civil liability be in terrorum. Now, I got to be honest, I don't know what that means, but I can tell you that it seems to mean <laughs> that the civil liability be enough to prevent somebody from doing something wrong. Someone let me know in the comments if I actually guessed that correctly. Okay. In order to effectuate Congress's intent that civil liability be in terrorum, the risk of its invocation should be felt by solicitors of purchases. The solicitation of a buyer is perhaps the most critical stage of the selling transaction. That's why I love this paragraph. This is just really good common sense here. It is the first stage of a traditional security sale to involve the buyer, and it is directed at producing the sale. In addition, brokers and other solicitors are well positioned to control the flow of information to a potential purchaser. And in fact, such persons are the participants in the selling transaction who most often disseminate material information to investors. Exactly. Thus, solicitation is the stage at which an investor is most likely to be injured. That is, 
by being persuaded to purchase securities without full and fair information, giving Congress's overriding goal of preventing this injury, we may infer that Congress intended solicitation to fall under the mantle of Section 12. One, bingo. I love it when court decisions make perfect sense. Um, it's unfortunate that they uh, uh, do not make perfect sense more often. Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. All of this stuff is particularly interesting, but it doesn't necessarily move the conversation forward. So let me just see if there's something I can jump ahead to. Mm-mm-mm. I want to back up. Okay. In fact, if anything, the advertisements at issue in this case, Instagram posts and YouTube videos are the types of potentially injurious solicitations that are intended to command intention and persuade potential purchasers to invest in the funds during the most critical first stage of a selling transaction when the buyer becomes involved. Pino fairly alleges that the nature of social media presents dangers that investors will be persuaded to purchase securities without full and fair information. Yes, this sort of common sense stuff is why reputable and legitimate investment groups do not crowd fund investments on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And um, where's that other place that Cardone loves to clubhouse? You know, um, yeah. And the thing is like, so, someone might make the argument when it comes to Cardone and, and his fraudulent nature, like don't hate the player, hate the game. He's just playing by the rules guys. That's not what we're talking about here. Grand Cardone has a horrible reputation among his peers. <laughs> It's not like he's in a dirty industry and everyone in the dirty industry respects his hustle because you don't want to hate the player. Uh, if you want to hate someone, hate the game instead. No, Grant Cardone is considered a con man by his peers. In his own industry, he's not respected. Don't be fooled by the glitz and the glamour and the fraud of Cardone's social media apparatus. Legitimate lending institutions won't touch the guy. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Uh, let's see. Uh, huh, huh, huh. In this case, defendants allegedly relied significantly on social media to source investors for the funds at issue here. Cardone posted on social media that Fund 5 was funded through crowdfunding using social media and touted the use of social media as an intentional strategy to reduce promotional costs. Accordingly, through their social media engagement, Cardone and Cardone Capital were significant participants in the selling transactions because they disseminated material information to would-be investors. To conclude that their social media communications fall outside the act's protections would be at odds with Congress's remedial goals, as observed by the 11th Circuit, da, 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 under defendant's interpretation of the act, a seller liable for recommending a security in a personal letter could not be held. Ugh, okay, I've lost my train of thought. I'm not sure what that's referring to there. For the foregoing reasons, we conclude that Section 12 contains no requirement that a solicitation be directed or targeted to a particular plaintiff and accordingly join the 11th Circuit in holding that a person can solicit a purchase within the meaning of the Securities Act by promoting the sale of a security in a mass communication. Okay, that's fine. We've sort of covered this. The First Amendment complaint contends, uh, complaint contends that Cardone and Cardone Capital engaged in extensive solicitation efforts, including through the Breakthrough Wealth Summit, a conference hosted by Cardone and defendants' extensive social media posts. Moreover, the FAC alleges that both Cardone and Cardone Capital had a financial interest in the sale of the securities, and uh, the Fund 5 and 6 offering statements describe compensation tethered to contributed capital and distribution distributions received by the funds manager, Cardone Capital. Okay, this is getting a little long-winded. Um, mm -mm -mm. For the foregoing reasons and those set forth in our accompanying memorandum disposition, the district court's dismissal of Pino's claims. I'm sorry. For the foregoing reasons and those set forth in our accompanying memorandum disposition 
the district court's dismissal of Pino's claims under section 12A2 and section 15 is affirmed in part and reversed in part. Okay, so again, guys, I'm not sure which part of the district court's dismissal has been affirmed. And I'm relying right now a bit on the information that was sent to me by the person who informed me of this ruling uh, that the discovery in this class action lawsuit against Grant Cardone is now going to move forward. But I am going to appeal to the expertise of hopefully some viewers out there. Please help me understand if that is a correct interpretation of what has been ruled here. It, does this ruling mean that discovery can go forward? Because that is my understanding, but I don't want to state it factually um, because I'm sort of, I'm not quite sure what I don't, you know, I don't quite know what I don't quite know here. Um, and I can tell you that Grant Cardone certainly celebrated uh, as if he'd scored a touchdown for the first time when this, <laughs> when this suit was thrown out originally and now that it has been reversed at least in part and now that it looks like this thing may be going to discovery um i think it's kind of a big deal and again if you're a securities lawyer out there and you want to um do videos with me on this uh explaining the ins and outs and the the nooks and crannies of this thing to the viewers uh please contact me at growing up in scientology at gmail.com and realize that this lawsuit isn't just about uh, is Cardone allowed to raise funds through social media? It's not at all. Uh, the lawsuit was basically saying that Cardone had basically issued materially false and misleading statements about these investments on social media. And Cardone was basically going, oh, it doesn't count if we do it on social media. Uh, right? So the fact is Cardone has been raising uh, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars by giving a bunch of bullshit promises and information about the nature of these investments. And that is what this class action lawsuit is about, is holding him accountable for essentially lying to investors. Now, what I've exposed him for on my channel has nothing to do with fraudulently raising money. What I've exposed him for on, on my channel is literally front running his own investors and stealing hundreds of millions of dollars in profits from Cardone Capital investors. And that front running is in part what the FBI was investigating him for. Also, um, through contacts I have who worked at Cardone Capital, Cardone, Grant Cardone has been caught on recordings collected by the FBI intentionally altering uh, to make uh, to mislead and just making up numbers in the prospectuses that he sends to his investors for these various investments. Um, so anyhow, I, I'm hoping that stuff like that, you know, the FBI has what the FBI has. That's of a criminal nature. Uh, what we're talking about here is purely of a civil nature. I, I'm hoping we get some sort of a, a bleed over. I'm hoping some of the evidence that has been collected by people who have been cooperating with the FBI ends up being shared with the attorneys in this civil case. That's my personal hope. Um, assuming that's permitted, you know, I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. So, um, yeah. Uh, let me look at the chat. If anyone's got any questions. Okay. That's fine. And also we're probably running a little short on time here. So that's what I got guys. Scientologist, con man, fraudster, Grant Cardone, uh, loses this decision in this uh, civil matter. And that's a Merry Christmas to me. <laughs> oh, the schadenfreude. Is that how you pronounce it? The schadenfreude I experienced with respect to Grant Cardone. Um, all right, guys. Well, I won't drag this on any longer than it absolutely has to go. That's all I got for you this evening. I hope everybody has a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. But I'll talk to you guys before the New Year. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye. <laughs>